Today, our exclusive guest is Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, James O'Brien. Mr. O'Brien, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for having me on. We appreciate your time, so I'll dive right in and start with one of the main goals of your visit, the peace agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Announcing your visit, the State Department stated that you will be there to support the process, including using the Alma Ata Declaration as a basis for border delimitation. In fact, Yerevan has agreed to this principle many times. Since you're there to support it, can we conclude that Baku is still hesitant to agree? No, I think both sides say that they're committed to peace. It's a momentous agreement. It will be a generational commitment by the two countries, and it's appropriate to be careful and take time. So the two countries have had a number of discussions at the level of the leaders, the deputy prime ministers, the foreign ministers, national security advisors, technical teams, just to be sure that they are aware of all the implications of an agreement. Um, I think the recent demarcation arrangement was a very good step forward. Uh, it acknowledged that some territory belonging to Azerbaijan um, had to be transferred, but also that the basis of further demarcation would be the Almaty Agreement. And that, I think, is a very uh, constructive basis for next steps. So what we are hoping to see is that over the next weeks to months, the two sides can reach an agreement. That would unlock trade and peace for um, many people across the region um, and is something that we strongly support, you know, provided that the, um, Azerbaijan and Armenia are able to reach agreement. And several months ago in Congress, you mentioned that the upcoming weeks would test the party's intentions. And since then, as you've mentioned, Armenia has handed over four Azerbaijani villages without a shot despite internal and ongoing crisis. While President Aliyev has made multiple new demands affecting even Armenia's constitution and national symbols. If you consider this period a test, what conclusions can be drawn from it? I, I think we're seeing tough bargaining really by both sides and I think a, a really interesting set of tactical choices about how to get to an agreement. So again, this recent demarcation arrangement was a trade of certain territories that Armenia knew it was going to have to give up and Azerbaijan agreeing to a demarcation line that they know um, Armenia will accept, the Almaty Declaration. And so each side made a, a compromise. I think this pattern of new demands and then um, further negotiations is one that at some point needs to, to stop. I think we know the rough outlines of a successful agreement. And really now, as I think I said in that same testimony, this is a matter of the sides being comfortable that it's time to make an agreement. So why is it time? In our view, there's a once in a generation, maybe several generations, opportunity to build a trade route from Central Asia across to the Mediterranean. That can come only if there is peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And that moment is, that would open up not just basic commerce, but new industries all across the route. That can happen now. In a few years, it may no longer matter as much. A few years ago, it wasn't possible. So now is the moment to, to do that. I also think it's a great moment because we are seeing the uh, countries all along that route see that they want less Russian influence. And so the democratic commitment that we see in Armenia the kinds of reforms that the Armenian people have supported again and again since 2018 means that they're at a moment of being able to make a decision like this. And I think when you have the convergence of those two factors, an objective availability of trade and the, the political moment when there's an opportunity, it takes leadership to recognize it and to conclude that now is the time for peace. That's the, our message in both capitals. And if parties agree, will the U.S. act as a guarantor of the agreement between Yerevan and Baku? 
Well, uh, neither side has asked us to play that role. We are very happy to support the peace agreement um, that the sides reach. And uh, the exact role that we might play, or no role, is really up to the two sides to, to uh, uh, conclude. We, we are not looking to, to serve as uh, um, intervener or superpower in the region. We're here to support the legitimate aspirations of the people of the region to, to make a peace agreement that will last for generations. And whatever role they think we should play is something we'll discuss with them. At the moment, they do pretty well talking directly to one another. If Washington won't act as a guarantor, as you mentioned, in what form will support for the process take, considering that Baku has already rejected U.S. mediation for several months? Yeah, I, I think in, in general, I mean, we've always said we're willing to provide whatever good offices I, the sides will agree on. Um, and we're not, uh, our feelings are not hurt by, by the role that we're playing. Uh, the kind of support we would offer, um, I think you're seeing now. I'm here in Yerevan today for our strategic dialogue. Uh, we've announced that we're elevating it to a strategic partnership. And what that means is working with Armenia to strengthen its democracy, its security, such as with its police and border police, and its um, economic diversification. Because Armenia needs to be able to trade globally um, not be as, and not be as dependent as it has been on Russia. So all these things are a part of making a stable partner for a long-term peace agreement. Those are some of the things that we would continue doing. We also have a relationship with Azerbaijan that is productive and constructive in many ways as well. And so we would work with the two sides. And then, as I said uh, as long ago as last fall in testimony, um, if the two parties are cooperating, particularly, say, on trade, we are very happy to support that by backing financing or um, working with companies to have them come and take advantage of the opportunities in a peaceful region. All of the ways that partners help one another, we'd be available to, um, to work with Armenia and Azerbaijan in the event of a peace agreement. And recently there was another demand from President Ali urging the dissolution of the OSC Minsk Group. Do you agree with him that the conflict has been resolved and the international community, including the USA, has no further role here on forward? Well, I think that's for the two sides to agree. So, you know, he's made that request and I, I think the, uh, the question of what kind of international role there might be in supporting a peace agreement is one for the two sides to, to reach agreement on, um, at which point we'll be very supportive of the, the agreement. And after the Azerbaijani attack on Karabakh last September, you stated that Washington would urge Azerbaijani authorities to facilitate the return of Armenians and restore unimpeded traffic via the Laching Corridor. Instead, Azerbaijan is demolishing buildings of elected representatives of the people who lived there for centuries. Are sanctions against Azerbaijan still on table, as you indicated last November in your testimony? You, what we indicated is that we would conduct and, and maintain independent review of, of what happened in September, but also ongoing relationships, and that we are doing. The international organizations responsible um, uh, have access to the sites, and they are able to provide us with the information that's, that's needed. We strongly support the right of return. It's provided for in international law and will continue to work so that those who want to return have the right to do so. The, um, the, again, in the context of a peace agreement, I think all these issues get much easier to resolve. It may take some time, but it is something that we'll remain stalwart in, in seeking to advance. So in Washington, you don't, still don't have a, a clear assessment what happened in Karabakh was an ex exodus or ethnic cleansing. We, we, we've, so the ICRC and the UN have had regular access to the site and to the individuals involved. Um, and they've provided some preliminary indications, but nothing that is definitive. We've commissioned an independent review 
by an outside group, a group that, that uh, advocates for human rights globally, and we're still waiting for that group to come back with its conclusions. You know, one of the issues of an independent review is you know, we can't rush it, so we're still waiting for that. And last week, President Biden and Macron issued a statement supporting the peace process in the Caucasus and further regional integration. Can you elaborate on what kind of integration might occur between Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia? Yeah, I, th I think, well, I wouldn't necessarily use the word integration among the three. Um, uh, both uh, Georgia and Armenia have expressed interests in moving closer to the European Union and to the single market, whether it's a tra free trade arrangement or, or something else. So that kind of integration, I think, would only be accelerated once there, were, um, uh, once there was a peace agreement and that would allow for investment in the institutions of Armenia and Georgia and, and others. But I, I think what we would see, you know, one of the benefits, a dividend of a peace agreement is not just the security that would, it would bring to people in the region, but the opportunity to have a trade route that would run from Kazakhstan all the way through Turkey out to the Mediterranean or up into the Black Sea. And that route would supplement another route that already sort of exists that runs through Azerbaijan to Georgia out to the Black Sea. Um, these two routes together would provide Central Asian countries with their first access to global markets that does not depend on Russia or, Frank or China. And so that kind of independent opportunity is one that, that we strongly support. And I think with that, you would start to see the economies of the region benefit from more openness, movement of people, um, and the ability of people to, to live where they want, which I think was the point of your question just before. And with that, that's much better for the people of the region. So we'd like to see that be the outcome. And uh, do you agree with the formula of Zengiz or Cardell that Baku is putting forward? Uh, well, we usually talk about it as a, a, a trade route. It's very much like the Armenian idea of the crossroads for peace. Um, and some kind of uh, route. Now there are pre-existing routes where the tunnels are already dug and the ro railway beds are in place. So it would make sense to, to begin by looking at those, but it's possible that it turns into uh, a series of routes that provide for some goods can, to go through Armenia up to Georgia, others to go through Turkey, and, and you get you begin to develop a network of roads, not simply one route. So I think it's a broad concept, and that's, that's what we support. Ahead of the upcoming NATO summit in Washington, President Biden has ruled out Ukraine joining NATO, stating peace doesn't mean NATO. This marks a notable shift from the sentiment expressed at last year's summit, where member states agreed that Ukraine belongs in NATO. What factors have prompted this change in Washington's position? So, I, I, there's no change in our position. I, I think the, what, what the president said, I mean, if I could just paraphrase, he said he doesn't believe in Ukraine joining NATO now. So our position really since Bucharest in 2008, but reiterated in Vilnius, is that Ukraine will be in the alliance when conditions allow. And the president was referring to this summit in July, and I think interpretations began to run away from the words. So that's our position is in July, we will build a bridge for Ukraine into NATO. And uh, that bridge will be short and well lit and well supported, unimpeded. Uh, it'll be clear that Ukraine needs to undertake some reforms um, and it will take some time to adapt its military from what it had been before Russia's further invasion to what it will be needed to be part of NATO. And we'll lay out that, both how NATO will assist in Ukraine getting ready. So we are talking about several steps. We're talking about NATO assisting with building Ukraine's future force so that it will know that it has a military able to deter and repel further Russian aggression. Um, but also that NATO will assist with Ukraine's reforms there's talk now of a senior civilian representative 
of the alliance to work with Ukraine on ensuring effective civilian control of the military. All those things will take place in this period, and then it will be up to Ukraine working with NATO to take the final steps to be ready for its consideration as a NATO member. That's the key. Now, more broadly, if I may, just for a second, I think what we are seeing in Ukraine today is a substantial change on the battlefield. So for eight months, Russia has been able to fight the war that it wants, um, largely because our assistance was slow in arriving. Ukraine was left to defend on the ground in the east um, and also against Russian air power that was able to be launched from very close to the targets, sometimes tens of kilometers away for some of these enormous bombs. And now the situation is changing. The Russian offensive that they rushed into the field in May seems to have stalled out with very minimal gains and horrific losses. 1,400, 1,500 people a day lost on the Russian side for nothing. On top of it, the air power is being pushed back. Ukraine now is beginning to take out the firing positions that Russia has used to devastate uh, some of the, the small Rus uh, Ukrainian settlements, but also to attack Ukraine's energy generation capacity. Now, Russia is being destabilized. Through all of this, the Black Sea remains open for Ukrainian trade. And you see Ukraine's economy begin to recover as it's able to trade effectively again. With that, and with decisions that will be made next week at the G7 and in July at, at NATO, Russia is facing not a victory in 2024, but the prospect of a war that will go on through 2025 unless Putin gives up some of his maximalist demands. And that's a complete shift in the strategic calculus. And the reason I, I went into some detail with this audience is that it is very relevant in the Caucasus because Russia wants to say, we will win in Ukraine and we will come back to the Caucasus. But Russia is not winning in Ukraine. And so it's not coming back to the Caucasus in the way that it was for so long. And now it's a time for it particularly, say, the citizens of Armenia to say again, we have decided we want to move forward. We don't want to move back. And now there's an opportunity to move forward because of Russia being bogged down in Ukraine. And my final uh, question, uh, in his last interview with The Times, President Biden emphasized also that Putin's war against Ukraine is about more than Kiev's aspirations. It's about his own imperial dream to reestablish the Soviet Union. With the upcoming U.S. elections and potential policy shifts, how can Ukraine, Armenia, Moldova and other countries threatened by Russia, as you mentioned, be assured of continued and unwavering American support regardless of election outcome. Are there specific measures in place to ensure that the U.S. commitment to these nations remains steadfast? Yeah, I think there are two things. One is we all have to do the work now. It's why I talk about there being a window for a peace agreement between Azerbaijan and Armenia today, um, with Russia getting back on its heels in Ukraine. Um, and with a, an economic opportunity available now that may not be there in a year. So there's a window. We do that work now. Once it begins, there is a, uh, it will continue. I think the same is true on the security side, that if Ukraine uses the next months to fight, as it has been the last month, and as it has whenever it's had the weaponry, and it conducts the reforms, that are important to join NATO and move toward the EU, then there will be processes in place so that even a different US policy would, would um, remain supportive. And that's the work we have to do. The second thing I would just say is, in US history, we have always had a thread of isolationism. Um, in 1941, while Europe was at war, the U.S. had law, a law that would have required us to cut our military by two-thirds to three-quarters. And we were barely able to change that law just a month or two, a couple of months before we joined um, World War II. In 1953, 
a, a new Congress and president took office and the Congress promised that it would take the US out of NATO and, and move us back to pre-war isolation. And of course, once those people got in office, they found that that would be unwise and not what they wanted to do. So, and I can go through other decades where there's always this kind of argument in American politics, but we have always done the right thing and stood by our friends when it came to it. And I have a lot of confidence in the American people that that's what we will do again here. But let's do the work in the meantime and then be ready to continue doing the work uh, uh, next year. Mr. O'Brien, many thanks for doing this. Thank you. It was a pleasure. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.